I'd like to do is talk to you about this soulmate part of your soul um, so that you understand what I mean by that. You see, when your soul splits into two, basically it cannot experience anything in its split state without there being some appendages. And what I mean by appendages is that you need a body, either a spirit body and or a material body attached to the soul in order for the soul to start, that half of the soul can absorb its experience. Does that make sense? So actually what God created is the full soul can absorb an experience only in the soul union state. The halves of the soul need bodies to start absorbing experiences. Does that make sense? Now, so what's really happening is, if you could think of it, there's these, like, there's these cords that connect the spirit and material bodies to the soul. And, uh, and I've layered them so that you can see them as separate, but actually, of course, your soul is bigger than you are. Your soul is actually surrounding the two bodies. And the soul controls even all the physiological functions of both bodies. Now, the soul interfaces to these bodies uh, through these connections that allow experiences from the outside world to enter the body and then through the body get funneled into the soul as an experience. And so that's how we start absorbing our surroundings. So as soon as we have a body, we're individualised, whether that body is just the spirit body because we die soon after individualization, or it's both, we are now individualised as the half of a soul. In other words, we now are starting to be conscious of our own experience. Now, the issue is that uh, this half of the soul can't exist on its own without there being a body attached. Or, if you can think of it, something else attached, which could actually be the other half of the soul attached to it. So when you think about the separation process, so here you are in the combined process, in the male side, female side, as it separates, it now needs the bodies to attach to that half of the soul in order for the half of the soul to gain experience. Right? So this half it splits away at incarnation, this half splits away at incarnation, and of course the bodies are created at conception of the, uh, of the two halves. Now when you think about that, you can see, actually, that the bodies are sort of like an attenuation in a lot of ways of the soul. And this is what finishes up happening on the earth. Because we're so distant from our soul, we start living in these bodies as if these bodies are us. Can you see that? That's what we start to do. We start living in here and here as if that's me. The truth is that's not me at all. What's really me is this. And I am the masculine expression of this and my soul mate is the feminine expression of this soul, right? And what we do is when, when these bodies are attached, because we've got all of these emotional uh, injuries in the environment in which we're incarnating into, we start living in these bodies rather than living in this soul. As a result of that, we start taking on all of the environmental injuries regarding these bodies and the soul. Now, when you think about that, the first sets of injuries generally that we're the most responsive to are our parental type of injuries. And these come right down to, in fact, the first time you open your eyes after you're born, you start observing, and after a while the clarity improves in your sight and eventually you can start observing quite clearly, the first form of the male in front of you, which happens to be, in most cases, your father. Right? So after three or four months and your eyesight's starting to clear up, um, you start observing the real male right in front of you who's picking, it up, picking you up and nursing you. And you start seeing the real female, which is your mother. And so you start identifying emotionally with these people. So that began at the conception. But uh, as you receive more and more and you see more and more and your senses of your soul open up more and more through these bodily senses opening up, as you grow, you're now absorbing things into your soul, belief systems, belief systems that your parents actually have, right? 
Now, one of the first belief systems that starts entering your soul too is what's the ideal man? And what's the ideal woman? And what do you think they're going to be? Very similar to what mum and dad is, right? So this is starting to get established. So if mum happens to be five foot three, quite slim and uh, quite pretty, then your ideal, and maybe a blonde, then your ideal may finish up at, during this formulation stage becoming that. But if you find your mother quite repulsive, then it might be the flip side of that, just depending on the emotions that come at you. And the same applies to your father. If your father happens to be six foot three and, and a bit tubby in the middle and, and, a bit, and pretty solid or whatever, then that becomes your definition of the ideal man, the man who's going to make you safe and secure and so forth. And so that enters you and enters your soul. So these are not truths that are entering your soul, but actually belief systems that we come to accept as true inside of us, which could, which could be an error. Now, there's no harm in having an ideal. The problem is, is that most of the time our ideals are surrounding our parental ideals, which is often very, very different from our soulmate and what they look like, what they act like and what they feel like because our soulmate is going to be an ideal for us personally, right, in terms of the mirror image of ourselves. So technically what's going to start happening now is we start living out of the soul when we start living more in our bodies. And we do that because that's what our environment does. So people on earth are taught to not be emotional, you know, even a young, young child, young child's there crying, there, 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 you know, you, you're already stopping the child from crying as you're doing this, right? And there's an emotion of distress in the mother, let's say at the time she's doing this, what's the child going to start feeling here? Every time I cry, mum gets distressed. There's going to be a responsibility thing set up. She, she doesn't have to say a word in all of this. She's just feeling these emotions. The soul is assimilating these emotions through the sensory apparatus of the bodies. And all of a sudden, she's starting to feel, the person, the baby is starting to feel these things. Now, the soul itself has a super set of sensory apparatus that the spirit body doesn't have. And the spirit body has a superset of, of uh, what you'd call apparatus or tools available to it that the physical body doesn't have. Now, what I mean by that is your physical body is said to have the five senses, right? But the spirit body has a lot more senses than five. And the soul actually has thousands of senses that actually change and grow as you develop in divine love. So... So what we're used to here is having our senses, right? We're used to having these senses inside of us physically, but in reality what we're so used to, a spirit would, would, would if they had to live in your body after passing into the spirit world, they'd go, I don't want to go back there. Like, like the senses of your body is so much limited compared to what I can do. Like every single spirit can teleport, can you? So, so like, you know, how do you feel? How limiting is that? Like if you, could, if you could all of a sudden start teleporting and you started getting used to it and after five or ten years of doing it of our time on earth, you'd be pretty used to that, wouldn't you? You'd be, even after a few months, you'd think it's pretty hot, wouldn't you? And so, and so what you would do is you, you'd feel really comfortable with that after a while and then somebody said, oh, you've got to go back to your body now. You'd be like pretty annoyed, wouldn't you? You'd go, why, do I, why would I want to go back to my body now? Like I can do all this stuff I couldn't do in that body because you've got a body that actually has a heightened sense, a heightened tools or apparatus in which, it can in which it can interact with its environment. So the physical body has a very limited set of tools in which it can, in which it can sense its, its, its surroundings. The spirit body has a super set of those tools. In other words, it has more tools available to it, but it doesn't have the tools that are available to it at the soul level. So this is the soul, and the soul has the maximum amount of tools available to it, even in its unhealed state. But in its healed state, in a six-sphere state, it has a huge amount of tools available, but then when it receives divine love, those tools all grow exponentially as well. So the soul is this ever-increasing amount of tools available to it. And that's a half of the soul. Once the half combines with the other half, then you've got a whole new set of tools available to that combined form, which is what eventually you'll start experiencing. Now, 
you could say that the soul senses are then, if you think about it from a long-term perspective, the soul senses are the most important senses that you could ever develop. Can you see that? Right. The senses of the physical body, right? playing tennis, the sense of the physical body, not very important to develop in the long run. Right. But it can be fun and you can enjoy it in the short term perhaps. But in the long run, it's not going to be something that is going to be something that gives you huge amounts of satisfaction, particularly when you can teleport and do a heap of other things and manufacture whole games that we know nothing about here on Earth. You're not going to feel much like tennis. Tennis is going to be like baby land, right, in terms of what I could do in that condition. In the soul condition, those kind of things become so unimportant. So can you see how as I go through and I start growing in different areas of my self-awareness, I first start developing generally, and this is the unfortunate truth about our earth existence, we first generally start ex experiencing our physical body senses. And unfortunately for the majority of the planet, we only ever develop them. Right? Now, we sometimes get into the spirit body senses. For example, our intellect is often starting to be developed and our intellect comes from our spirit body's brain. Right? The spirit body has a, has a mind and that's what is part of our intelligence. So we start developing that. Unfortunately, we become we're often brain dominant in that process, right? But we develop that part of ourselves. But we neglect huge amounts of our spirit body senses even, in our own development here on earth. But then we get onto the new age path and we start realising there's this thing called mediumship and there's healing and there's all these other things, right? And so we start to experiment with these metaphysical, what I'd call the metaphysical truths, which are all surrounding the spirit form. But for the majority of the planet, the soul development is totally neglected, isn't it? All right? Now, because it, this is a soul-to-soul -soul union that we're encouraging with our soulmate, can you see it's going to confront a lot of the belief systems that we have about the development of the other forms. So, for example, I'm standing here in a physical form. Mary's in a physical form. I'm going to come along into this relationship, if this is a soulmate relationship, I come along into this relationship with a lot of preconceived intellectual ideas of what is my ideal. They're based on emotional connections that I have to my parents and what I've perceived from them to be the ideal. So, so if my mother, uh, my mother is five foot three, she's quite slim, she's, uh, I suppose you'd classify her as brunette, um, and that's my mother, then that becomes part of my physical ideal for my soulmate. Does that make sense? And unless I'm willing to challenge that ideal, I'll probably look around and anyone taller than five foot three gets neglected <laughs> in terms of my attractions because of this emotional connection to the parent. Does that make sense? And so what's happening is I am judging everything through the development of these two parts of my form and the errors that have entered my soul as a subsequent result of that. And I'm judging my entire surroundings, including what my soulmate should be through that. And so what do I do? I walk along the street, my soulmate walks past and I don't even notice her. And the reason why I don't even notice her is because the soul part of myself is undeveloped. Now, once I develop the soul part of myself and I start opening up towards the other half of myself, what is starting to happening, starts to happen, is that I'm no longer focused on these bodies so much anymore. Right? Right? So I now start perceiving myself as a soul with these appendages, which we will call bodies. But I don't see the bodies as me. I see the soul, the, my real me, I can feel inside of myself, my personality, my attributes, my characteristics, my desires, my longings, my passions, my intentions, they all form my soul. 
And I'm really starting to really focus on that. And, uh, and ironically, in that place, at the same time, I'm starting to see everyone else around me in the same manner. So I'm not really seeing their face. And I'm not really seeing what they wear anymore so much. Can you see that? It has to sort of be outstanding and really strike you before you notice those things because what you're really starting to notice is the soul. The thing that's really the real person. You're starting to notice that. So you're starting to open up this soul part of yourself. And as a, as a, as a part of that process, the soul mate part of yourself starts getting opened up because you start becoming sensitive to the flows of feelings going on between yourself and any other person who comes into your f f field of view at the soul level. Right? In other words, any other person that comes into your soul awareness, which doesn't necessarily mean that you see them, it can actually mean that you can feel them. So you'll be able to start feeling every single person around the planet, pretty much. As, you, as soon as you're aware of them as an entity, you can now start to feel them and what emotions they have and what feelings they have, what desires and passions they have and what belief systems they have that are all a part of the soul. And you can do the same with your soul mate. Now, what happens electrically, if you like, from an energetic perspective, is your soul is now not fully just connected to your bodies anymore. But your soul is capable of bypassing your bodies for its experience. Do you follow me? Right? Because you're developing the soul's capabilities, you're now capable of not just experiencing the soul through the bodies, through the connection of the cords that are connecting the body to the soul, but you're actually now capable of experiencing things at the soul level without the bodies being involved. And this is what your emotions are all about. When you feel an emotion, most of the time you don't need your bodies to experience these emotions. And it's the emotions that actually are the most powerful part of you, if you think about it. Right? Many of you who have started connecting to your emotions start to understand this in a more fully, full manner. What, so what you start feeling and experiencing inside of yourself is this deep, Feelings that when you're emotional, it doesn't really matter what the emotion is, when you're emotional, that's the real you. And you can start really feeling that that's the real you. And every interaction comes from that place inside of you, the feeling place inside of you. And what happens to your body, and you might be throwing your arms around and throwing your legs around like you know sometimes I do or whatever, that's just an expression of your soul's emotion. The body is just now the tool by which your soul is expressing itself. And you don't need that tool for the soul to express itself, actually. Right? Now, once you start doing that, you start opening up to experiences. And, and it's these emotions that are related to the male and the female that you start experiencing that are, that are what I would term the soulmate part of yourself. The soulmate part of yourself is capable of being developed without your bodies being involved, without your spirit body or your material body being involved. And the beauty of that is your soul starts feeling other souls at that level. So you're not judging things now through what you see. You're judging things now through everything that you feel. Everything you feel is now the important thing. Now that being said, your soul mate, what you, now let's say you're walking along the road like this, right? And you've got not only these bodies that you're expressing yourself, but now you're very, very aware at the soul level of all this stuff that's out there from your soul that bypasses the bodies. In other words, the body isn't interested, you're not really interested in other people's bodies anymore. You're now interested in just in their soul, right? And as that comes out of you, and you walk past your soulmate, what do you think you're going to start experiencing? You'll be going, whoa, <laughs> something's going on here, right? So it's a bit like, you know how when you get magnets when you pass them by each other and they're attractive, you know, it's like, uh, whoa, like, you know, it's pretty hard to keep them apart. And that's what you start experiencing. You go, whoa, wow, this is, this is really different. 
This is different than every other person I've met. Every other single person you've met is going to be different experience than your soulmate experience when you're open at this level. Does that make sense? And so you walk past and you go, no, this is very different. Something's really up here, right? So when I met Mary, and, and all that happened was she came and sat down in front of me and I was talking to her brother and she came down and sat down in front of me. And I, I didn't know what to do because it was just like this feeling that I could feel was a totally different feeling than I could ever remember in my entire life ever having. And she just sat there. And she looked at me like I was some like, pretty dumb person, really. And, well, I was a little, 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 wasn't I, really? Like, I didn't really know what to say. And no, Mary didn't judge me like that. I'm just saying that's uh, how, how it felt. But, but I, I was just, like, tongue-tied because I, because I was just feeling these feelings. I didn't know how to express them, and certainly I couldn't express them to Mary in the situation we were in, and I didn't feel I could. And so, like, I just, it just was overwhelming. Now, when I met her in the first century, it was a very, very similar experience for me. Exactly the same kind of experience. It was like walking past the building and, whoa, what's going on here? Like, there's something going on here between my soul and this person. Right, what's happening here? And the beauty of healing the male-female part of your soul, the soulmate part of your soul, if you like, healing all of that, and allowing yourself to feel the passion and desire of that grow is that your soul bypasses the bodies in its, in its awareness and now you feel the other person without... It's like their body isn't there, almost. Right? And, and all of a sudden, feelings rise in you that are the result of this soul-based interaction. Right? Now, once that happens, you then have come to the first time to realise in your life, not at an intellectual level but at an emotional level, that there is such a thing as a soulmate connection. And you also start to realise how special it is and unique it is. It is the most unique connection and also everlasting connection that you will ever have. So many of you are very connected with your families. But to be frank with you, by the time you reach the third, fourth or fifth spheres of the spirit world, you're not going to be very connected to your family compared with your connection to your soulmate. Right? And by the time you reach the celestial heavens, the only times that you'll be connected with your family is if they've reached them with you. Right? Because aside from your soulmate connection, you will feel very strongly that you do not need or desire or want any other connection other than this one. This one is like the essential connection that's there for the rest of your lifetime. And God created it that way this, because in, in regard to somebody else, it's somebody else is going to be able to completely understand you, not for any other reason that they are you. Right? And you think about a lot of times what happens in a relationship is we're looking for someone who understands us, right? Well, once the soulmate relationship is perfected, the soulmate is you. So, of course, they're going to understand you. Does that make sense? They're going to have very, very similar feelings to what you have about all sorts of matters and issues. A lot of people then go down and say, oh, you're just in love with yourself then. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, you are. That is what soulmate love is. Soulmate love is a perfect love of yourself. Not in the sense that, like, when I love Mary perfectly, I will also love myself because myself is the sum total of the two of us together. Is that not true? The way I'm describing it. And so the soul, mate, the soul part of the whole complete soul is really loving itself completely once the two halves completely connect with each other. That's what we're really doing. We're actually allowing the two halves to connect completely. And it's that part of your soul that needs to be open. That's the soulmate part of your soul. And that's the very unique thing that can only occur with your soulmate. No other person on this universe can connect with you in the same manner. Does that make sense? Mary, you want to? 
going to come up anyway. No? Oh, okay. <laughs> Mary's not feeling good today, so she's indecision. In indecision. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask you if you could talk about why God created soulmates. Do you, or what the process... Uh, I think you touched on it, that this person is actually a part of you. But I find it really beautiful the way that um, God created a partner for us to grow towards God. Mm. And if we're doing that, um, we will naturally come together. Mm. Yeah, what Mary's referring to is that... If we just rub this out... Do you want to describe it while I draw it? So we're down here on the earth, right? So here's the earth. We're standing on top of the earth. There's me. But that's not the real me, right? They've, I've got a spirit body as well, and that's not the real me either. The real me is my soul, right? And then there's my soulmate somewhere on this planet. Say she's over here, down here. Sorry about the size of my soulmate. <laughs> I, have to, I have to be on the other side if I'm going to... I can't see what you're drawing. No. I think it'll be interesting if AJ cannot describe it while he's drawing. <laughs> <laughs> I meant that very lovingly. <laughs> so we we come down and start the process of individualization onto the So into the So we've gone from this soul Sorry. <laughs> Now I'm not allowed to say anything. <laughs> I'm being controlled. <laughs> so we've incarnated. We've incarnated. And then as we... So obviously in this imperfect world that we live in, at the moment, through this process, we gather lots of injuries um, to, on our soul, mm. right? So you could so, say we began in a first fear condition, basically. Yes, yep. yeah. Um, but as we start to heal our soul and if we involve God in that process and we develop a desire for God, then we'll start to grow towards God as we increase our desire and work on our injuries, uh, releasing our emotions. Mm -hmm. And because we're soulmates and our soul is essentially the one, we're halves of the same soul that has its own personality and passions and desires, each of them unique, that God creates in us, as we continue to grow, I can talk. <laughs> I'm, allowed, I'm allowed to talk? No. Just so I can see God. <laughs> um, I'm letting you control me. <laughs> That'd be a change, hey? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> um, so as we continue to grow, because we have the same characteristics and personality in our soul, mm -hmm. as we release more and more emotion and go through our spheres of development, we will naturally come closer to each other because of these inbuilt things within our soul. Yeah, so the irony is that the way God created it is that if... If one half of the soul follows its passions and desires all the time... In it, harmony with in love. In harmony with love, it will always attract the other half of the soul. Mm. That's, the, that's the beauty of it, right? And, of course, as you progress through the spheres, you're getting closer to God, but you can see also what's happening. You're getting closer to each other. You see, and that's why... That's one of the reasons why the God, your God relationship is, one of the, is the most important relationship. And the reason why is because it... Through that relationship, you can heal a lot of your soulmate injuries. So a lot of these injuries that we pick up on the planet, we can heal just by progressing towards God. The more divine love we receive, the more we relieve, release ourselves from emotional injuries, particularly emotional injuries towards the opposite gender, if we're a heterosexual type soul. And, and if it's a homosexual type soul, we release emotional injuries towards the same gender and the opposite gender. It's exactly the same. We need to release both the male and the female-based injuries, whether, what, whatever, whatever type of soul we are. And 
And as we do that, we just get closer to God. And as we do that, we're automatically drawing our soulmate to us. You see, when you follow your desire and passion, your half of the soul is following its desire and passion, and the other half of your soul is already being drawn into that same pattern. Right? Because you're actually helping your complete soul into this state of finding your desires and passions. Like it's, it's just a beautiful arrangement when you think about it. And the fact that um, when, as you release more and more injury, your personalities and passions and desires will grow more and more similar. You have like the perfect playmate to develop yeah. spiritually together. And, that, and when you're in the soul union state, that's what you are. You're just a, like one soul that feels complete within itself. Does that make sense? You feel completely complete within yourself because you are actually feeling each other and feeling each other's desires. And because you have the same desires as your mate, your desires get multiplied. Does that make sense? So look, you imagine if I have a desire to teach and Mary doesn't have a desire to teach, can you see that there's not a flow? There wouldn't be a flow of energy on that one subject. But because we're half of the same soul, Mary is going to at some point have a desire to teach. And she's already demonstrated that. Even though she's really afraid about getting up, she still needs to get up, right? That's part of the soul, right? And so what happens is my desire to teach, if Mary allows her to enter her, it enters her and that increases her own desire to teach. And then that increases my desire to teach. And it's like a circulation of emotion that builds in intensity, right? as I and as Mary follow our desires. So the sum of our desires is greater than the part. Yeah. So it's, so it's no longer like one and one is two, right? It's now one and one is ten times as much, right? Because I'm now... And then as we grow towards God, our soul's power, in terms of its ability to experience emotions, is growing exponentially as well. So, so now it's not one and one is ten anymore either. It's like every time I grow and step towards God and every time Mary grows and steps towards God, now this intense emotion starts flowing. Emotion that weeks ago or months ago I wouldn't have been able to cope with experiencing without even dying perhaps. And now I can feel it and cope with that emotion. Right? And this is why like a, a spirit in the 22nd sphere, if they came to you and projected at you all of their emotion, you'd just die from it. But they're loving. But they're loving. But you die from it because the intensity of the emotion your soul isn't able to cope with. Right? That's how powerful they are, feeling their emotions. So what they do is when they come to you, they attenuate their emotions to suit your condition. So if you imagine this build up and build up and build up, circular build up, and you imagine love for each other doing this. So my love for Mary enters Mary and she accepts it because she's, re re she's unblocked her emotional injuries about accepting love from her soulmate. And then she's also unblocked her emotional injuries about giving her love to her soulmate. And, so, and I've unblocked my re emotions about receiving love from my soulmate. And now all this love enters me from her. And then all this love overwhelms me into her. And you imagine, so imagine the love bond between the two halves as that grows. And all that impedes its growth is our injuries and our inability to accept some truths. And, and that's why I feel the desire for God is so important mm. because it's easy to reach a point in the relationship where you feel kind of comfortable. Um, and so unless you have this burning desire to deal with your own soul and grow towards God, you can stagnate. You will stagnate. Yes. Yeah. So we've seen people get together as soulmates and then stagnate in the second sphere for years and years and years and years and years, right? And we've seen people on earth do the same. Get together with their soulmate, I mean, get together with their soulmate, and they've got compatible injuries that are acceptable to each other that they don't want to deal with because they're not growing towards God. And so they end up staying the rest of their life as soulmates in the second sphere. That's really sad, I feel, because you have the potential to be like this immensely powerful and loving being if you continue progressing towards God. So, can you see if your desire for God is number one, then even though the desire for your soulmate, which is your desire for your own soul in the end, is it not, is number two, 
no matter what happens with this soul, your desire for God will cause this soul to grow. Yeah? That makes sense, doesn't it? Whereas if you put your soulmate number one and your desire for God number two or lower than that, what will happen then? What will happen is you will get to the point where you get your soulmate in your life, you'll feel very self-satisfied and you'll relax with the whole process, and you'll enjoy the fact that you've caught up with them and you'll just stay in that place. So there are souls in the sixth sphere state who have met each other many thousands of years ago and have never grown from that state. So they're in a relationship completely in the spirit world. They think it's a soulmate relationship that I'm talking about, but it isn't because they've not even gone through the, so the union with God yet, let alone the union with their own soul yet. Right? And, and so what's happening is they get stagnant here in the sixth sphere. And they just stay in that place. Now, you've heard of Ramtha? Well, Ramtha and his soulmate were in that place for quite some time, right? Th th tens of thousands of years. And when we talk to them about progression beyond that point, then they started progressing. And all of a sudden, they get into these higher spheres. And now their union is even greater. Does that make sense? So while before Ramtha was the very dominant part of the soul, uh, that was allowed at the sixth sphere, he is now less dominant and there's more of the feminine part of the soul inter like interacting as well. Now he's in the eighth or I think he's in the ninth sphere or tenth sphere now. Um, and that causes a very, very different feel from him. So anybody who would be connecting to him before would probably feel like, oh, this is a different person. And it is a different person because it's a person who's changed quite markedly. Okay. Yeah, so that's... The process towards God. Can you see it's just a beautiful design, isn't it, in the end? It's like you know, it makes perfect sense to the soul. And it also makes sense as to why we want to always have this feeling that we want to be with somebody in the end. Because at the end, there is this soul desire for the other half of yourself. And it's always there. Jen, can we have a mic up back? Is there? I've got 25 questions, but I'll Only try and many. stick to one. Yeah, yeah. Um, my question is, in the whole plan of God, is it possible that the sum total of our soul injuries might be a positive um, development of our character in the whole plan of things? Or is the soul injuries, like coming to your parents as a half, to be viewed completely negatively? Um, I would never view... Um, you wanted to say? I would never view our uh, soul injuries as completely negative. However, they were all created by man's avoidance of God's laws. So they were all created by our walking away from God in the first instance. So we don't have to have soul injuries to enjoy this process of union with a soul mate. And in the future, there will be people born on this planet into a six-sphere state who, and who grow towards God after that state and they won't need to deal with any of the soul injuries that many of you are currently dealing with. They'll just be able to enjoy the process instead of feeling the pain of the process. Does that make sense? So we certainly don't need to have injuries in order to get to God. God designed it that we didn't need to have any. But unfortunately, because of the free will issue, what we have a tendency of doing is, because of free will, not having humility. And that kicks off a whole negative series of events. But even in that negative series of events, all of our injuries end up working out to our benefit. It's really weird. But that's what happens. Like we tend, up, we tend to, because of all of the different injuries that we gather, we tend to go through them and then we realise certain things and that creates some of the passions in certain directions. 
I, I feel that that's the way God designed it. It's like um, that I love the potentialities in God's design. So God didn't design us to suffer, but he gave us the potentiality or he gave us the gift of free will and within that he saw our potentialities. And so then he created a whole other set of laws like the law of attraction, the law of compensation, all of those things to allow us or to encourage us to grow towards God. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? So all those laws confront the error that is within us anyway. So, so eventually... it's still a loving, it's still a loving design. Yeah. The loving, the perfect loving design is that we don't have to suffer, that we're not designed to suffer, and that we can go towards God. But because we have free will, there's a potentiality for suffering. But so then... he put in a whole other set of loving laws to bring us back away from the suffering. Mm. Okay. So now a big question. You, 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 you follow along the path and the plan. Um, you do your best. You go to God. You find your soulmate. You get to the 22nd sphere. But what's the point? You, it, it is a wondrous journey. It is... I feel the magnificence of it. But you're getting all the way there and then... What happens? You s then you what's the point? Then you is, begin your is life. What's the point of it? <laughs> then you begin your life, Jen. Then you're individualised and you're ready to go. You're, you've completed your individualisation process and now you start to begin to live, really live. Right? <laughs> so, you know, everything from there to there is actually not yet fully living. I've just had that emotionally hit me. That's like unbelievable. So there I'm you're so like. I'm so glad I asked that question. There you're like a newborn babe sitting in Big Daddy's arms, but Big Daddy up there, right? <laughs> Big Daddy's arms, and, and Big Daddy's now ready to teach you some things. You think you've learned up till then? Well, Big Daddy begins <laughs> teaching you <laughs> things. All right. So, so the problem with infinity is that our human mind is impossible to conceive. It's impossible for our human mind to conceive infinite, infinity. It is possible for our soul to conceive it because our soul has the capacity to infinitely grow. And so that's where it's possible. And as we grow, we have more of a conception of what infinity really means on every level, emotionally more than any other level. And so what happens is by the time we reach this place, we realise... I'm just a little baby ready to begin my journey now as a completely unified soul, two of us together, completely unified soul, to learn a whole new set of things. A whole new set of things that, that we could never have learnt before because we didn't have the emotional capacity to learn it. And the intellectual capacity by this stage, remember the intellectual capacity has just fallen apart. That happened the intellectual capacity fell, fell away from us at the seventh sphere. That, that went then. And after that, everything became more and 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 more emotional. Right? And, and we didn't have this... The intellect now becomes a subset of our soul. It's a, part, it's a part of our soul, but a very minor part of our soul. It's what we use to express a lot of things. But the soul's emotions are the most powerful thing. And that's the problem, is if we don't allow ourselves to open up to the soulmate part of my soul, then I'm also precluding myself from all of those additional experiences. Just like if I don't allow myself to open up to the God connection in my soul, then I'm precluding myself from all experiences above the sixth sphere. Right? The problem is, is that we become so, so addicted to our own intelligence right, that we often get to this point and think there must be nothing beyond that because I already think I'm pretty good. <laughs> right? And the problem is, on the divine love path, you don't ever feel that. You just feel, as you grow, you just realise, well, I'm, I'm a lot smaller than I realised. And it's sort, of like, it's sort of like becoming fully conscious of your relationship to God in the sense that you're a lot, more small, a lot smaller than you realised when you thought you were when you began it. But you're also a lot more connected and you understand infinitely amount more of intellectual information 
because you now are capable of understanding at the soul level. You're understanding the universe at the soul rather than at the mind. So it seems to me that in the whole process that faith and trust in God will unfold the whole journey. Yep. And that if you have different desires and passions to the person who you think is your soulmate, then faith and trust in allowing the whole journey to unfold will then allow the journey to unfold. Yep. And it may not come from a soul injuries. It may just be part of the whole process. Because yep. I know with Graham and I still there are... I'm the creative part, the artistic part, and Graham's the mathematician and, and the more the engineer. There is creativity, but it's a different kind of expression. And I've had trouble with that, yep. trying to match, match, for want of a better way of putting it, match the desires. But as your part of your love grows, you'll eventually start understanding the engineering part of it and understanding the mathematical part of it, because the only thing that's blocking you to that is a heap of emotions from your childhood and from your school years and all of that, right? And then, and then he will do the same, because the only thing that's blocking him to the artistic side is a lot of those same kind of emotions in relationship to what happened during his upbringing as well and the degradation of emotions and so forth. And then you will find that you will merge together with all of those experiences, right? So you'll become the engineer, he'll become the artist, and you'll both be the artist and the engineer at the same time, right? And with a very, very unique emotional signature that not another person on the universe actually has. Right? I can't help feeling gratitude. Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm, I'm full up here. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? To put it mildly. Alex, down the front here. Did we have someone over here who was asking something? No? We'll just go to Alex first. And then. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about what you said before. We've experienced that when we've been apart. We're very connected to God, God-focused, very strong connection to God. When we come together, we become very um, uh, focused on each other. Yep. So the God part falls apart. Yep. So then we're very conscious of that now. So, you know, we totally... You know, always focusing God first, God first, God first. Yeah. I know now that everything falls, just falls into place beautifully when once we prioritise God. Yep. I just want to ask, like, how, how, you, how you two do that? We, we have the same have issue. the same problem. The same yeah. issue. And what we do, instead of trying... See, most people would say, let's go, let's go and separate them because we're not getting closer to God. What my feelings and Mary's are... Let's work out why we're involved in this rather than involved in this and this. Do you know what I mean? Let's go through the emotions of why we connect to each other in this regard and step away from God when we're together. Does that make sense? Mm. And there's usually a lot of emotional reasons for that that we need to address, each of us need to address. Yeah? So in my case, there's a lot of pleasing Mary emotions that I had to address. In Mary's case, there was a lot of feelings of like, God doesn't want her, God doesn't, you know... God can't remember her, God doesn't want her, those kind of feelings that she needs to address. Does that make sense? There's different emotions for each of us that cause us to go away from that connection. The key is to deal with those emotions, let yourself feel your way through. Yeah, and sometimes we've gotten caught up in resolving the emotions that are between us and forgetting to just pray about it all and, and we just have to, we just remind each other all the time. Mm. But yeah. Can yep. I just want just one more thing? Is it possible to reach a twenty seconds for your state on Earth? Yes. That's hopefully In what, theory. <laughs> that's hopefully what we'll be able to demonstrate to you. That's why we came. Cool. You know, just the experience that I was talking about yesterday. If Monique starts having the same experience, and we start coming together in that regard, mm -hmm. that'll trigger lots of different emotions in you, certainly. Because remember how when you came together a little bit, you started feeling like, whoa, this is a bit much for me, mm. starting to want to back away, you know, so that's in both of you and you need to allow yourself to feel that. It's yeah. like as well, uh, like I'm really into this thing about longing at the moment. Um, you know how before I was talking about the longing and what kind of space that is, it, also with the longing for God, I feel like you can have injury and develop a longing and when you develop your longing for God, then that 
really triggers all the emotions that are in the way. Same thing with your soulmate. If you develop that really raw, vulnerable longing, it's going to trigger everything that's in the way. So obviously, you know, we're not in the 21st sphere now, but we can still develop the longing to a point that sort of pulls us up. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So for us, what it is is a process of everything we remember we have to grieve because most of it's about loss, right? So everything we go through, we generally have to grieve. So we have to be prepared to do a lot of grieving, right? And, and that's sometimes the difficult part. I'm not, at the moment, very prepared to grieve much about myself and Mary's not prepared to grieve much about uh, a number of things and so that prevents the connection from actually occurring. When I'm prepared to grieve and she's prepared to grieve, things get back into track again and we start progressing towards God and towards each other again. For many of you, it will be different emotions. Shame, anger, grief, rage, you know, all these different emotions are all preventing the connection with your, with your soulmate. But when you think about it, they're also all preventing your connection with God. So, so of course, it, it, having to deal with them with your soulmate is going to help you a lot of dealing with them with God. And obviously, if I put God first, then I know I'm always going to progress no matter what my soulmate does. So if my soulmate stops progressing, I'm going to keep progressing. And if she has the same view as that, then obviously there'll be this thing going on where she'll progress a bit and then I'll feel a bit stagnant, but because she's progressed, it makes it easier for me to progress and then I'll progress a bit more and so forth. Does that make sense? And you end up in this sort of moving up like that, you know, one helping, the other helping back towards God. If you take God out of the equation, which, by the way, many, many billions of people do and million billions of souls in the spirit world do, then you'll get to a point where, in the sixth sphere where you just can't progress any further. So you'll have a soul connection with your soulmate, but you won't have a soul union with your soulmate, which is a totally different experience. If you can imagine the emotions at the sixth sphere compared to the seventh sphere, the seventh sphere is like a thousand times more powerful emotions than the sixth sphere. Right? So if you can just imagine what it's like to then be in the eighth sphere, ninth sphere, tenth sphere or whatever, in terms of the emotions and what you can create, it starts to really blow your mind. And of course, mentally and intellectually, we can't conceive of it. And you'll see in the pageant messages when you read it, sometimes Paget asks, you know, what's it like there? And they'll say to him, look, there's no way that you can actually conceive what it's really like here with your intellectual mind. Does that make sense? They'll just feel that. They just feel, and there's no way you can until you personally experience it emotionally. Now, Jen point, brought out a good point that I'd like to just highlight, and that is if you have faith and trust in God, it is the simplest way to speed up your progress. Because you know what our biggest problem is? We want everything to be intellectually validated to us before we allow the experience. And if you're one of those people who want everything intellectually validated before you allow an experience, that's going to be the slowest possible progress that you can make. Right? So my suggestion would be to have a look at that emotion in yourself and try to deal with that. What's that about? And you'll get down to some feelings of where you've been hurt in the past and can't trust anymore and all those kind of things. Let yourself work your way through those things. A lot of times, a lot of people hear all these things presented from myself and Mary and they feel like, oh, they're just describing a utopian universe. Yes, of course we are. That's what God created, one of those things, a utopian universe, right? <laughs> That's what God created. Man creates the other. God created the utopian universe and we're trying to describe to you what it's like. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you want to just describe what happens, has happened between us? Like, sure. Yeah? Where, where should we start? <laughs> um, what do you want to illustrate? Just, the, just the, how the emotions affected different things? I yeah, think. how the emotions affected desire, how they affected um, your own feelings towards myself and my feelings towards you and, yeah. and how, you know, once we release certain emotions, how things change quite rapidly and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So should we start when we first met? Yep. Let's do that. You want to describe it from your perspective? <laughs> Come over here and sit down with me, Dave, and we'll describe it. Uh, well, when I met you, 
I thought I, I um I knew I was going to meet this guy that my parents were quite into at the time who um, was teaching this spiritual path and believed he was Jesus. And I kind of had this image in my head of sort of a middle-aged kind of a guy with a beard, bit of a pot belly. <laughs> Uh, someone who fancied himself a fair bit. Um, <laughs> and, and then I met AJ and I was like, wow, he's kind of good looking. <laughs> Not what I expected. Um. <laughs> uh, but we didn't have any long exchange because I was quite wrapped up in, in lots of other emotions. But I was quite interested in the path he was teaching and I tried to ask him a few questions and um, he just sort of gave me like yes or no answers. And <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think about this Course in Miracles stuff? Because I really, I feel like this and I feel that's right out of line. And he'd say, yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, I did do that. <laughs> it's very unlike me, isn't it? But anyway... <laughs> Um, and anyway, skip forward a bit and um, my parents told me um, that AJ felt that I was his soulmate. And that was, that really affected me like... Um, what did you say? <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, they sat me down and had something important to tell me. And um, I had absolutely no idea what it was going to be. Uh, and they sat me down and they went, well, you know that guy, AJ, you know that guy? And I was like, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, well, he believes that you're his soulmate. <laughs> and I went, oh, I knew that. Like, st first thing out of my mouth. And then I went, no, I didn't know that at all. <laughs> That's really weird. He didn't talk to me. Um, and so I was really shocked by the words out of my mouth, but I completely dismissed them because they, they didn't make any sense. Um, so, so Mary sort of felt like I never talked to her, right? Which is very true. I didn't talk to her very much at all. And, and I was sort of like, um, for me, the emotion was I was just so overwhelmed emotionally because it was like that, that, how I describe, you know, walking past somebody or that you're open to emotionally now and I just, wow, this girl's my soulmate. What do I do with that? Like I've been looking to, for her for such a long time and there was lots of emotions in me. I felt quite teary. I didn't know what to do. I was just about to say, to talk a group, I think. Helga and Klaus were there at that group or whatever, and, and Peter and Claire, I think, were there. And, and, and I, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. I just, like, I, what do I do? Like, inside of me, that's what it was like. You know, like and, and she comes up and talks to me before the group starts. And it's like, now I'm like, I don't know what to do. And she asked me, as she said, these questions. And, and of course, I didn't have much to say about them because... Uh, because I just didn't know what to say. So <laughs> what do you say? Do you say, yeah, actually, yeah, you're my soulmate. And uh, yeah, now that I think about it, boy, I've got a really big attraction to you. Like, <laughs> you know, like it's very confronting. And I could feel, I was extra sensitive to Mary's emotional condition. So I could feel her hurt from a breakup of a previous uh, relationship. I could feel how uncertain she was feeling about her life. And I just felt like if I said something to her that it would just like, it would basically just sort of put more pressure on her. Basically, that's the way I was feeling. Yeah, obviously I didn't have the same magnetic thing happen that AJ had towards me. Mm. Um, yeah, but then when, they, when my parents told me, um, I, then I couldn't let it go. It was really, I didn't understand and I'd never seen a DVD. They didn't exist back then and um, I'd only heard him talk for a couple of hours and I was really... Um, but for some reason, I just, I had lots of other things. I had a job in Lebanon and I'd just broken up with someone and like all other kind of things happening in my life, but I couldn't let it go. It was really, um, I just would sit outside and do that a lot. Like I couldn't, I couldn't understand why, why I couldn't, I didn't even know half the stuff about the divine love path. I didn't really, but I just was really shocked. And then I got in, quite indignant. This guy, has told other people and he hasn't told me and I'm going to I'm going to find out about that so I, I sent you an email mm. now there was a fair bit in between those two places though oh, yeah. because we actually caught up uh, at Helga and Klaus's and did another talk and oh, or, or I did anyway and 
And I arrive at this talk thinking that Mary wouldn't be there because I could feel that Mary was a bit angry with me by this stage. No, I, w I wasn't by then. Oh, but yeah. at the talk, you started talking about... Um, oh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, you started talking about something... But your father was quite angry with me by this stage. Yeah, yeah. but I thought that AJ was actually talking about... I, I hadn't decided if God existed or not in my life at this point, but AJ was talking about the closing of the heavens and I thought, hang on, this guy's talking about an unloving God. That's suddenly I had all of these really strong opinions. That is not right. That you know, and why is he saying he's Jesus? If he was Jesus, he wouldn't be saying he's Jesus. And I really like all of this emotion came out of and I got really quite angry. Graham, Graham and would remember and Helga would remember. Uh, I, I wasn't saying very much, but obviously the emotion coming from me was quite huge. And, and the emotion in me was a fear of my soulmate's anger. So there I am sitting down trying to talk about things and my soulmate's projecting anger at me and I'm just going into like meltdown that I'm trying to avoid. And, and so these little children were coming up and sitting on my lap and distracting me through the whole process, of course. This is, children are great like that. And, uh, and I, just, just, I was in this turmoil, in a turmoil. This is before I knew about the soulmate thing. Um, and I, of course, had no idea about the impact I was having on AJ because I, I thought he didn't even know who I was. Um, and when we left that meeting, I was so... Like, I had such a weird uh, experience of emotion that I made my parents... Well, I was with my parents and I was like, I don't know what's going on with me. I need chocolate. Like, I was very, like... <laughs> I don't understand. Yeah. So, so then a few weeks later, we did the first talk at Peter's place at Udlow. And, uh, and I, I could feel that Mary was thinking of coming. And that just like put me into this place. I, I was actually down, I don't know if you've been to Peter's place and walked around the gardens a bit, but down by his office, you can walk down the stairs and there's this little tiny private place down there, which I went down into. And I just sat there like shaking. Like just shaking, not because I was worried about talking in front of 100 people, but because I was worried about Mary rocking up. <laughs> <laughs> and knowing by this stage that she felt a little angry from the previous experience with uh, what she'd been talking. And I don't know how I was going to cope with that. And, and, then, and then I realised that she wasn't coming and I was almost a relief, you know, to, to not have Mary come. And, uh, and so I never saw Mary again uh, until I went overseas after that. And uh, um, so I didn't see her before I left to go overseas or anything like that. But I could feel that, wow, she, she's really angry with me. Um, I could not understand why I was angry. And I wouldn't have even said I was angry. I just felt uh, like there was no reason for me to have any... Like, I, my parents have been on a spiritual path for 30 years. I've met a lot of people who believe a lot of unusual things and... Uh, have unusual <laughs> lifestyles but I, and that none of that ever made me angry I just went oh that's what they're into whatever but for some reason I was I was really um, very emotional <laughs> and that that was really strange for me and when I found out um, what AJ felt about me I felt really freaked out as well like I don't understand all these emotions and it's very scary for me yeah the first time I met Mary uh, Cornelius was with me and we drove away the next day because we stayed overnight at Mary's parents' place. And I drove away the next day and he said to me, you think she's your soulmate, don't you? And I said to him, Corny, if she's not my soulmate, I've got another 10 years of emotional processing to do. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was getting pretty overwhelmed, like just being in the same house with her. And, but that all being said, like Corny spent most of the time talking to Mary and I spent hardly any time talking to Mary. And... and uh, I, and, and, we, and I was just so nervous that um, I didn't know what to do really. Uh, and I had a lot of emotions to work through as a result of that. A lot of emotions of feeling unworthy, a lot of emotions about feeling the soulmates blocked to me and feeling a lot of grief about that. And, uh, and so I started allowing myself to work through those emotions. And I then went overseas and I just kept working through those emotions. And then Mary sent me that email that I told you about earlier. Um, where she demanded of me why, why I hadn't spoken to her about this supposed soulmate connect, soul connection that we were meant to have had, and uh, and that's when I sent back a very long letter. Just I decided at that point, well, no, I need to be open. I need to be honest, and this is why I'm encouraging you to do the same. Just be open and be honest, and just let the chips fall 
where they may and allow yourself to experience the emotion of that. Do you know what I mean? Or just allow that to occur. So what happened over the following months was that uh, we entered into conversations and eventually came conversations every day and then Mary, Mary decided that she wanted to investigate whether I'm her soulmate or not. And we very pragmatic about it and all, Mary's, I? Mary's very practical, right? So she, she decided, no, nope, I'm just going to sort it out. I need to get over to where you are at the moment. And by this time, I was in England, right? Um, or before then, we were in Barbados and we decided this. I was in Barbados and Mary's in Australia and we decided, no, let's meet up when we're in England. So, so Mary flew over and met up with me uh, in England. Like, I picked her up from Heathrow Airport and we spent a week... Uh, we decided the best thing to do was just a, I'd hire a two bedroom place and we'd just spend a week together and see what happened, right? And see what comes up. And four days into that week, Mary has her first big emotional experience. Um, yep, and I, um, so I really thought that I kind of had my life together. I was pretty. <laughs> arrogant uh no i thought i've lived overseas you know uh, you know i've dabbled in spirituality i kind of feel like i'm finally getting close to 30 and i feel like i finally know myself and um <laughs> how ridiculous anyway so i go over to meet aj and i have no concept of really what an, what emotional processing is i think i know what it's all about but i really have no idea and four days in, I have this overwhelming emotional experience of grief and loss and abandonment that's inexplicable and it relates specifically to him. Uh, yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, and, and, and there was quite a lot of, like, anger towards me that you couldn't understand because you've never really been an angry person most of your life, right? Um, and there was quite a lot of anger coming at me. You left me, you like, like yelling at me about what I'd done to her in the past. Right? And, and it's really hard to explain because it was like... And then Mary went into this really big shutdown like, towards me. Like, no, I can't even look at you. Can't even look at you. So, so I went off for a walk out in the sheep farms. We were at Oxford in England. And... Uh, a terrifying experience. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know if that's relevant to other people. But many of you are going to be terrified with some of the things that come up between yourself and your soulmate. Right? And uh, the key is, I feel, to stay in the transaction. Right? See, a lot of times what we do when <coughs> things that are terrifying come up, we don't want to stay in the transaction. We want to get away from the transaction. We want to leave it. We want to avoid it. We want to avoid our emotion of it. And my feelings are like the more we have stayed in the transaction, no matter how long the transaction's been, like it sometimes has been months before we've come out of one particular emotion together. And the longer we stay in the transaction, the better both of us finish up working way through our emotion. So um, then Mary had a number of these experiences, which of course I was sort of expecting, but, but not... You didn't expect I didn't expect angry. that she'd be angry with me. I thought, you know, soulmate, meet your soulmate, all lovey-dovey, everything will be fine, right? <laughs> not on. Like, that didn't happen at all. Instead, a lot of the stuff of me leaving and me dying in the first century and all this kind of stuff started coming up. And, and it shocked Mary intensely because she wasn't expecting that. So before this point, I was actually feeling quite romantically attracted to AJ, quite desirous of him. Um, uh, yep. And as soon as I hit these big emotions, I, no, nothing, nothing. I didn't want, like, by the end of the trip, I, I just felt no physical, emotional attraction to him at all. Mm -hmm. So, so by the end of the trip, we're coming home and, uh, and I can just feel like total, my soulmate is just totally blocked to me. But I can feel the reasons why, like all the fear and terror that's in her. And, and so, so I could feel it in Mary, all this fear and terror, and, and, but shutting down really harshly, like really harshly shutting down herself too, right? And, 
Because also by this stage there was a lot of projection coming from my family and that really affected because I was very uh, hooked into their emotions. Um, that shut me down a lot. There was a lot of disapproval coming towards me and so I felt that I could... ...that also made the emotions towards AJ um, wrong mm. emotionally. So I wanted to stay in this transaction and work our, our way through it... ...but Mary just said, no, that's it. Like, there's no attraction between me and you. And uh, we've, <coughs> we've just got to go our separate ways. And, um, and so what happened was we came home and at the airport... Uh, ...Mary's parents picked her up and whisked her away. And uh, literally. And I went home with my son Tristan... And I just spent the next four or five days just crying about, about it. And uh, Mary, you sort of f spent the next week really in turmoil, didn't you? Like, like total turmoil about it all. And then Mary decided, she invited me over to, to talk about it uh, on the weekend. And I went over to talk about it. But uh, I finished up just getting attacked by the family instead of really just talk talking about our issue together. And after I came away from that, I realised that actually things were going to get worse, a lot worse with the family. And, uh, and, that, uh, and there's a high likelihood that we wouldn't be together. And for me, that just triggered lots and lots of stuff. And so for the next nearly three months, I spent basically... Um, uh, I cancelled all of the talks, as many of you around that time know. And I, all I did was just... Uh, ...focused on my emotions about dealing with that and just stayed in my emotions. And, uh, and as I said, I got to some really deep emotions about how I viewed myself... ...how I viewed myself in comparison to my soulmate and all these other emotions. And once I got out of that, within a, I knew within a few days Mary would probably call me. But Mary, went through that time, went through lots of different things too. Right. Oh, yeah. That was really dark for me I, because I didn't know how to process emotion and uh, I, I was in terror, self-attack, uh, total um, fear of what the... It was hard for me to have a soulmate desire because of the whole bigger picture of identity. Um, I felt like my whole life was falling apart. I didn't have any direction um, and there was a lot of pressure around me to shut down emotionally. Mm. And what actually, I think it was an, you processed some of the anger you felt or rage one weekend, wasn't it? And that caused you to give me a call the following weekend or something? Is that what happened or...? No, I actually um, decided I wouldn't... I tried to stay on the divine love path because obviously I felt it was the truth. And so I tried to uh, stay connected with my emotions, but there was just so much inside of me that I was resisting. I couldn't do it. Um, and I did connect to a little bit of anger, but then I just felt so despondent and I said, that's it, I'm not doing it. I'm not on the divine love path. I'm not even going to pretend anymore. Uh, and I actually, uh, after two weeks of that, became quite suicidal. I felt like I didn't know what I could do. And that's when I called you. That's right, yeah. And so um, we just talked again and I just said to Mary that, look, you don't have to be with me, um, but, but I'd love to be able to help you connect with your emotions and stay, you know, stay on the path if that's what you want. And, but, but you need to decide what you want, basically, and, and, but I'm happy to support whatever that is. And, uh, and so um, we finished up talking a bit then, didn't we, on the phone about your emotions. And I think... Within a day, you connected to some big emotions about God uh, that helped a lot. Yeah, and then um, and then Mary started to come along to the groups a bit. Like, still very tentative, weren't you? Um, still very quite mistrusting of myself, and but but tentatively coming along, feeling the judgment now of some in the audience, you know, towards her because some now knew that uh, I felt Mary was my soulmate and so forth. And feeling quite bad about that at times. And, uh, and then can you see how as things are going, I'm working through emotions, she's working through emotions. Like, like we're both working through different emotions. And, and our relationship in terms of coming apart and coming together was dependent on how much we were shutting down our emotions and then reopening our emotions again and then shutting down our emotions again. It's like a pattern 
And so there was another time where we separated again for a, for a period of time where Mary decided, no, that's it. She told me again that she had no attraction for me whatsoever. And, um, and um, that's, that's a really powerful thing that I learned is how much fear can affect desire. Like when I went into places of deep fear, I lost all attraction to AJ because um, his life, his identity was the cause of my fear. Yeah. Or the, the trigger, the for, trigger my for my fear. fear. Yeah. So, so it was fine while I was just AJ from Mary's perspective. She could candle that and we could have a relationship on that basis. But as soon as any Jesus stuff came into play, then basically Mary went into this place of terror, terrif terrified really and tried to shut me down and, tried to, and then I had to say, well, no, hang on a sec, I can't be shut down on this issue. I told you at the start who I was and, and so that created a lot of uh, difficulty um, as well. So my, trust me, telling someone near Jesus is not the way, best way to find your soulmate. No, that, that's never, it's never worked for me. In the first century it didn't work very well and didn't work this century either very well. <laughs> but um, so anybody who says that I've got an emotional investment in being Jesus so that I can attract Mary um, has, has no understanding well. of what's actually happened <laughs> between us whatsoever. I find it, I find it hard because to uh, give an example of this stuff because I feel like our experience is somehow different. Is yeah. Um, what I'm trying to illustrate though is more how whenever you, myself, whenever myself or yourself got into a shutdown state yeah. towards the other, that automatically caused us to, search, to go apart. And whenever we weren't in truth with each other, right, and this is a big thing to understand with your soulmate relationship, whenever we weren't in truth with each other, no matter what that truth was, Right? So if that truth was I was attracted to 25 other women or something, and if that truth didn't come, if that truth wasn't said, there was automatic pulling apart between the two halves, like automatic. And as soon as we started speaking the truth, no matter how bad it was, there was an automatically drawing together again. Right? Because we, and this is the interesting thing about the soulmate union is it is totally dependent upon truth. Right? So all of the lessons you learn about truth are so important for your soulmate union. Right? So what happened between us then was that we started realising how important truth was no matter what. And, uh, and as long as we stayed in truth, we could stay open and stayed open to our emotions, thing would pro things would process really well. But of course that there was pretty difficult emotions to deal with still. And so um, I had difficult emotions to work my way through and sometimes when I was working my way through an emotion, Mary would start feeling responsible, which would, which would actually make it worse in terms of dealing with my emotion and then I'd talk to her about that and then she'd feel bad about that and, and there was this constant toing and froing going on then emotionally. The key, is, the key for us has been stay in the transaction. Right? We've attracted this relationship, stay in the transaction. And I think living in the truth of the emotions as they happen, like um, uh, like we have uh, gone apart for even a day or two when we felt this is not working. Like instead of st sticking in, sticking in, or skipping over, or making the best of it, or um, mm -hmm. you know sleeping in the same bed when you're really actually going through a lot of grief or anger with the other person. Um, actually physically being in the truth of whatever's happening mm. really helped. So if I feel blocked towards Mary in any way, I can't sleep with her. So we automatically, and Mary now feels the same way, so we automatically part and we sleep. Uh, fortunately, where we are, we've got a tent down one side of the block and a tent <laughs> somewhere else. And so we just sleep in separate places. Right? We come together back again in the morning or during the day and we start talking about the same issue again and if we can't deal with it that day then we sleep apart again. And the same goes the next day and the next day and the next day until and sometimes we've slept apart for up to a week or two weeks at a time doing that, dealing with the emotion but sleeping apart. It's happening more rarely now but there's still occasions where I can feel Mary's got some grief to feel about me and if I'm with her she doesn't allow herself to feel it so I just... I withdraw out of that and, and there's times when I've encouraged Mary to, to go away completely, like 
for as long as she wants um, to deal with some issues. And uh, so any person who says that I'm somehow got my claws into Mary, as Mary is well aware, is not the case. Um, yeah, because it's just so untrue. But the, the issue is allow each other to deal with your emotions, allow each other to state the truth to each other, no matter how bad it sounds and no matter how bad you feel as a result of it, because it is a part of your law of attraction. So allow that interaction to occur. Yeah. I was just going to say that that's been really powerful for me. Like in the beginning I really wanted to skip over a lot of emotions until I realised they're not going to go away, they're not going to be out of the relationship until I actually speak it and say it and we deal with the emotions that it brings up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just um, wanted to ask, um, dealing with a lot of anger towards men after not really not realising I had anger towards men until coming into the relationship mm -hmm. um, and at first projecting a lot caused a lot of shutdown and a lot of, a lot of negativity in the relationship. Yep. Um, and it's only been after yesterday's talk, sorry I can't remember um, the woman's name, um, talking about the rage and how I blame I've blamed Alex for everything he's done. Um, I've blamed him instead of looking at myself and not wanting to own my anger and, and get into the grief fully. Mm. Um, and I've seen that I haven't been able to love. I've just realised I haven't been able to love him or anyone in my life. And just last night, seeing him as not my father, <laughs> which sounds funny after so long, yeah. and seeing him not as... God because my father was God to me yep. so he's not God and he's not my father and just he's he's just this beautiful soul I just saw last night yep. and so love yep. was actually able to start to love just came down from God and 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 to Alex and we we realize that it's just the the soulmate love is is from God not from within ourselves that was really beautiful. I, my question was around anger towards men, Mary. Um, to how to be in a loving space when processing anger towards men and be vulnerable when there's so much fear and there's so much grief in, in the process. Do you know it's not? Don't just get from from the from the beginning of the rage to the love. There's there's a whole lot in between, mm. and and I see you being really loving to to your soulmate and and really encouraging and not projecting, and and how did you get from the that place to? Uh, I, I was talking to someone the other day and I said, I'm the example of not what to do. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I still do it sometimes. But I did have a big realisation recently about how much it's changed. Because when we first got together there was... Every emotion that was triggered in me, there was huge rage going towards AJ. Um, it was just through those, you know, just through truth I, and owning it, removing myself physically from him to, to deal with it and acknowledging I was so afraid, like I was so afraid to be in a vulnerable space. All this stuff about... Um, him being better than me, if he, you know, could see stuff in me, um, him controlling me, if he could, you know, you're relating. <laughs> yeah. There was also, though, wasn't there, um, you went through some emotions of blockages to your own emotion because that, that was a big part of the change. Like what happened was that um, me, me, we would have a discussion 
which once Mary started connecting emotionally to the discussion, her first emotion was always rage. Right? So she'd firstly project a heap of anger about the discussion. And then, and then she'd get over that anger by going and doing some anger work or whatever. And then she'd get into her fear and then often stay in the fear, but sometimes then get into the grief. But the grief wasn't very frequent. Right? But then when, when we started looking at the whole process and it was actually about blockages, it was actually about the fears and her fear of her own emotion, that she wouldn't survive some of her own emotions. Um, once she started working her way through that group of emotions of how she really, what she believed about her own emotion, then her projections at me went, like, changed markedly. Yeah. Yeah, and at the moment, like, I don't know how this happened, um, but now I I can feel like this, fe like I have a lot of stuff going on about my dad at the moment, but I, I really realise that I'm not projecting that at AJ anymore. Like, he's he's someone different to my dad now. Like, um, but that's part of, I think that's part of opening that soulmate longing as well. Like, that's shifted as well as this... Um, yeah, I'm not as afraid of my fear, of my grief. Yeah. yeah. The only reason why we get into rage anyway is because we're afraid of feeling a deeper emotion within ourselves. So, so when you start focusing on I'm allowed to feel my fear and I'm allowed to feel my grief and also there's this belief of that had to enter Mary at some point and I, and I think you remember it now, like this belief that you could cope with it, yeah. wasn't it? Like, because up until that point, you would always say, I just can't cope with this. Mm. I just can't cope with this. Mm. I, can't co I can feel all this grief in me and I just can't cope with it. Mm. And, and that, because she felt like she couldn't cope with it, she always get into anger instead. Does that make sense? But once she got through that and started to see that she herself could cope with this emotion that was inside of her, then it changed quite a lot after that. I also just processed a block around feeling that I was never allowed to be angry with my dad. And that was really powerful, like, um, because it was okay to be angry with AJ if he was like my dad, but to be angry at my... I realised I was so blocked at being able to feel, feel that as, if, as little Mary. So that's, that's been really, really changed things. So the men, the men in Mary's family used to project, would project things at Mary and Mary wouldn't get angry with the men in her family in return. She'd just get angry with me <laughs> before then. Seriously, right? it was pretty bad. So it was like every time her family got angry with me and with Mary, Mary would then get angry with me as well. And, uh, and so I, I had to work through some emotions about that and allowing that to continue and I had to eventually say to them, Mary, if you want to keep doing that, then we've got to go our separate ways because that's not loving to me. And... And so we had to, you know, there had to be some quite a bit of emotion I had to work through of allowing the woman to be angry with me all the time. And, um, and so I worked through those groups of emotions. And then Mary worked through this emotion of also of not allowing herself to actually feel towards the person who she really felt towards, the, the rage towards, because um, she felt disallowed from that in her childhood. So... Mm. So a lot of it was about getting rid of uh, this feeling that I can't cope. Many of you are having this feeling, right? I'm not going to be able to cope. I'm not going to be able to cope. And so you go into this place of, oh, I can't cope, I can't cope. And, and that's what shuts you down. The truth is that if an emotion is coming up for you right now, God designed your soul to cope with it, whatever that emotion is. God designed your soul in such a manner that you can cope with whatever emotion is coming up from within inside of you. That's how God designed your soul. But you have to get to a point where you trust that. And that's an emotional place. It's not an intellectual place. It's an emotional place inside of you. I also think that I had in the beginning so much rage at men which was actually... Um, I had to be really honest about every situation and every... <laughs> what was going on because it wasn't I couldn't process rage at men that didn't get me anywhere it was actually I had a lot of blocks to feeling the powerlessness or a lot of blocks to feeling the fear of vulnerability or a lot of blocks to feeling uh less than a man and, you know 
so now when I think about it, I don't feel like I have any mean anger. Sometimes I still get angry, but it, I feel like I've got these whole other bits of emotion that man anger just seems seem to cap. And I've spoken to a few, quite a few women who it seems like that, you know, like, oh, I'm so angry at men. But as I got deeper, it's actually quite a specific uh, bunch yeah. of emotions. A bunch yeah. of fears within yeah. yourself about your own self. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you go into some of those, Mary? The them. Um, sorry, I'm doing that. <laughs> Feeling powerless around men. Um, Feeling that I'm less than men, that um, feeling that a man is going to control me, um, grief about the way men have treated me, feeling like I'm responsible for the man's emotions. Um, yeah, a lot of grief about uh, feeling that um, men don't see me, men. Uh, view me as a sexual object, that um, that men have physically harmed me, um, that I've been violated, that kind of that those kind of feelings, yeah. And that now I feel really close, like a lot closer, and I'm connecting to some of those feelings quite powerfully, yeah. But it took just it took time to yeah get there. The, the rage or the anger is always covering over these more specific emotions. And the problem with rage or anger is, it, is it's very similar to the emotion of unworthiness. We can use it as an excuse to avoid the deeper stuff. So when I, when I say to you, oh, I feel unworthy, that helps me skip over all sorts of reasons why I'm unworthy. You know what I mean? And if I say to you, oh, I'm just angry, that helps me skip over all the reasons why I'm angry. And, and you've got to be willing to get into the reasons why. And a lot of us aren't willing to get into the reasons why because all we want to do is be angry. Because being angry is powerful. Being angry means I can blame everybody else. Being angry means I don't have to look at myself. Do you know what I mean? And I can get away with that. So, and because then society generally also allows me to get away with that. So what, what I finish up doing instead is I just say, oh, I'm angry. Don't, don't bother me, I'm angry. You know, like... And why are you angry? Don't, don't ask me why I'm angry. <laughs> because I, the truth is I don't want to know why I'm angry either because I'd rather be projecting rage and stuff and blame at other people and I don't want to admit to myself that I, 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 I want to do that. And in the end, once you get your way through that and you admit to yourself, oh, I do want to be angry, I do want to blame, I do want to project rage and anger, I don't want to release this emotion, then you get, start getting more honest about, all right, what emotion am I angry about? What, what is it that I'm angry about? And then you start really, then you're starting to deal with your fears of what am I angry about? Oh, I'm angry that I'll be controlled. That's a fear of being controlled in the end, isn't it? And I'm angry that men have violated me. That's a fear that you'll be violated in the future if you open your heart up to a man. Or a fear of the grief of being violated and so forth. Uh, Alex had a question. You went. Oh, I was just going to ask you, at what point did you realise it wasn't your law of attraction to cop that anger anymore? Well, that's an interesting question because um, from a, when you're on the receiving end of anger or rage, quite often you think you have to put up with it, right? And you go through lots and lots of emotions putting up with it, don't you? You say, why are they doing this to me? What have I done to them? I haven't done anything to them. Why are they hurting me? Da, 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 da. And you go through all of those kind of emotions and then after you grieve a lot of those emotions, you realise actually, well, I don't deserve this anger. <laughs> and I'm allowed to say that and I'm allowed to draw a line in the sand and say that's enough. And when you get to that point, that's when you've healed a lot of the reasons why you allow somebody's anger. Up until that point, you allow it and then feel the resulting emotion. And the key is just to allow yourself to process those emotions and you'll get to the point where you no longer allow it. And when you get to that point, like you don't even have to be angry in return. I just said to Mary, let's sit, Phil. <laughs> Next time you're angry with me, you're out of here. <laughs> right? I'm not putting up with that anymore. I don't, it doesn't matter whether you're my soulmate or not. I am not. I am not your dad. I am not these abusers from the first century and you're treating me like I am. Right? I'm not these people who harmed you. 
I am a man who loves you and cares about you, but I do not deserve this treatment anymore. Right? And once I got to that point, myself inside of myself, Mary also felt the firmness of that. Before then, I was pretty wishy-washy about that. So, do you know what I mean? I'd, I'd say that, but you know, I'd put up with it again and say it again and put up with it again. And, do you know what I mean? But that, I got to the point where no, inside of myself, there was just no, I'm not doing that. And I felt a lot of hurt about having to get to that point too. And it didn't make, it didn't actually stop me being angry. Yeah. I still had to work through the emotions but I, of anger. But I put it to Mary that she needed to make a choice of what she was going to do now from now on about this anger that she had. She, if she was going to project it at me, then she needed to leave. Right? She could do anything else she wanted to do with her anger, but if she wants to project it at me, then she's got to, got to go. So what she decided to do at that point is she left for a week and, uh, and worked through a lot of stuff. She went over to Millie's for a week and uh, worked through a lot of things about why she was feeling so angry, owning her own process. So before then, there was a motion that Mary went through before then of not really owning her own emotional processing, sort of almost expecting me to drive her emotional process. And when I just said that to her, no, I'm not responsible for your emotional process. Uh, you're responsible for driving that. If you don't want to do it, then stop getting angry with me about it and just say to me, you don't want to do it and that's it. Do you know what I mean? And when Mary worked through whether she wanted to do it or not wanted to do it for herself, then her anger projections changed quite a lot as well. I had huge feelings of resentment of the inevitability of our life and this is my soulmate and I can't choose and, uh, you know, I, I've got all this stuff in me now and it's got to come out and I don't remember choosing this and, well, uh, you know. And there was also a <coughs> bit about if you did deal with it, you would, I would die anyway and what's the point? So, so there's a lot of her first century emotions that are, I'm going to die anyway. Um, so what's the point of her dealing with the emotion and opening up her heart to me when, when I'm going to die again anyway and then she'd have to go through all of that grief of having opened up her heart to me. So there was a lot of that emotion inside of her going through her as well at the same time. But I think the key shift was this shift that all of us need to make. And this shift is, am I going to be fully responsible for my own emotions? Do I really, really want to be an emotional being? Do I really, really want to be connected to God myself? Not because of anybody else, but because... This is in me. I want this for me. And once you get into that state, you get a lot less resistive to being, having truth pointed out to you. Mm. Um, sorry, Monica said her hand up. <coughs> so, AJ, I just wanted to ask you um, a question. I think they've actually got it sorted out, but it was earlier on on behalf of a group of spirits who've been here since yesterday. Yep. And it was just going back to a point that you touched on yesterday that if you um, don't come together with your soulmate that um, I can't remember specifically did you say it was past the eighth sphere or something that it had a huge ramification on your own progress or does that ring a bell? Does that make sense? Because um, they were a bit anxious that some of them had met their soulmate and they'd rejected them or vice versa and they were now kind of getting a bit anxious about what would happen. The only thing you can't do is make the transition between the 21st and the 22nd sphere. Right? Up until that point, you can progress as much as you want by yourself. However, I must say, you will still have to heal the soulmate part of yourself right? before you make the transition into it one minute with God. And you will then have many truths about the soulmate part of yourself that you will learn between the transition into at one moment with God and at one moment with your soulmate. Now, by the time your soul gets into that powerful state, it's highly unlikely, and I've never, to be frank, I've never seen it occur in my life time of 2,000 years. I've never seen it occur where one soul in a lower state hasn't been attracted to the soul in that higher state. There's a law of attraction between the soulmate halves, obviously, mm. and the the more one progresses, the greater the pull is on the other one in the lower condition. Yeah. So, so the pull on the, on, the, on the soulmate half that's in the lower love condition is so intense that it's impossible to resist in the end. 
So the more the person progresses towards God, the other half of the soul progresses towards God, it's impossible for their soul mate to actually avoid progression. Uh, so is it while. really a case more of time then? So for example, in, in the case of Joseph and Miriam, like it's inevitable, but it may just take a very, very long time. Yes, like in the case of Joseph and Miriam, it was 2,000 years, obviously, between when Joseph entered the celestial spheres and Miriam now is even looking like entering the celestial spheres, right? But that was because of a lot of emotions that Miriam... This is a couple, by the way, that, that Monica has channeled, that we've talked to. So um, by the time Miriam... Um, because Miriam had a lot of emotions towards... Uh, was it towards Mary, weren't they? And a lot of anger and rage towards Ma uh, Mary and myself. She was hooked into myself being her soulmate, so she wouldn't let go of the fact that I wasn't her soulmate. She felt really a lot of rage towards Mary, that Mary was not worthy to be my soulmate from 2,000 years ago. So because she had all of those emotions and she wasn't allowing herself to deal with those emotions, she was holding herself in this position. And no matter what Joseph could say to her, she wasn't allowing herself to get out of that condition. And that required and a law of attraction event, which was our eventual talking through you to her again, um, that actually triggered her out of that condition. But sooner or later, every single person will draw their soulmate, no matter what. Now, as soon as she got out of the resistance to her own emotion, she felt an attraction to Joseph, right? And this is the thing, is as soon as we can help our soulmates get out of their resistance to emotion, then they will automatically feel an attraction to us anyway. Right? But how long that takes is going to be very dependent upon the will of that part of the soul and how they exercise that will. And in Miriam's case, it took 2,000 years for her to exercise her will to feel those emotions. Yeah. Now, when I say it took 2,000 years, um, she was obviously ready by the time we had the conversation to very, very quickly change. So over that 2,000 years of time on Earth, she had obviously released quite a lot of that emotional baggage that got triggered in the first century. That, um, and she was in a place of readiness to start looking at her emotions in a serious manner. Yeah. <clears throat> so for the spirits who are feeling anxious, uh, although I feel they've realized a lot of this anyway, but for the spirits who, who do feel anxious that their soulmate has either rejected them or they've rejected their soulmate, if they just focus on their connection with God, that the rest will all follow naturally. Yes, and also God is always working uh, towards opening up of every single one of his children, including your own soulmate. So God has always got lots of things in play. So part, part of the opening up of Miriam in play was our return to earth. And, uh, and in fact, Cornelius has experienced very much the same thing. There's a lot of people Cornelius harmed in the first century who have been in the hills for 2,000 years, and his own return to earth has actually helped them all move forward. Uh, and many of these ones who have been harmed by him are now moving forward on the divine love path because of this opportunity that it afforded us to do to help these ones. So the beauty of uh, a lot of what God's plans are is eventually everything comes to helping each person. God is intensely interested in the welfare of every individual and intensely interested in having you experience as much bliss as you can possibly experience. And because of that intense interest, he's also intensely interested in helping your soulmate open up at the soul level too. Yeah. Yeah. And there are many, many spirits, by the way, in the spirit world who are trying to assist your soulmates to open up as much as what you feel you are. Yeah. Just the first thing is, I think it's probably, if Mary's going to be doing more teaching, maybe she could have a microphone like yours, a really cool one. We're buying, we've bought one actually, <laughs> but, but it, it doesn't come through for another two weeks. So, yeah. And um, the, the other thing is, I've re just read the book Go West, and it, what sort of a description is that for like the hells? Because from what you're saying now, the spirits can, they know even if they're in the hells that you're back on earth, but from what I've read in that book, they need to borrow a, a body or uh, they need to borrow an avatar? No, there's a lot of spirits in the spirit world who believe that's the case because of the teachings of reincarnation. 
And so they actually try to infiltrate a human body who's connected to another soul, obviously, uh, in order to express themselves back on Earth. So a lot of the things described in the book are based around beliefs that are actually false. And, and spirits have just as many false beliefs as we do here on Earth. And as a result of those false beliefs, they take actions that are actually disharmonious with love to accomplish their false beliefs. And, uh, so there's no ghouls or...? Uh, no, there are, um, there are forms in the spirit world that are constructed by groups of spirits constructing them together energetically. And those forms take, off, take on a lifelike image. They're a bit like a puppet, if you like. They take on a lifelike puppetry type image, but it's the projection or control of the groups of spirits who control that image. What about the devils in the lower part of the hell that were never human? Uh, they were, yeah, there are many spirits who believe that the people in the lower parts of the hills were never human because they are so inhuman now. But the truth is they were all human at one time. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why the belief about the devil got propagated is because spirits who passed into a bit better condition looked at these so-called devils and thought, how could they ever be human? And as a result then said that there was a devil that, you know, that, that separated from God and, and uh, what, who used to be an angel and who degraded in condition. In reality, every single being in the spirit world came from this planet right, that I've ever seen. And they, they are all in very, very different conditions. And the most degraded condition looks far worse than anything you could imagine. Right? So, uh, so it is such an intensely bad physical, emotional and spiritual condition that you couldn't even imagine the evil that they're capable of, of doing. Right? And those particular ones are the so-called devils of the spirit world that many much spiritual literature talks about, but they are not actually devils, they are people who lived on earth who did a lot of very evil things while they're on Earth, and as a result, their soul condition is very evil still. Just uh, one other thing: the, the Paget messages, mm -hmm. um, the bits where, um, where is it James? James Paget? Yeah. Yep. The parts where he, they were channeling to him for his emotional releases. Yep. Do, do you know where they might be found? Or um, no, a lot of them got destroyed. Um, the reason why he destroyed them is that he didn't want his personal life. Uh, displayed in public to other people. You can see why I've exposed my personal life in public to others and you can see what happens uh, is that people then just attack you and denigrate you. And he wanted to avoid all of that. And so what he did was he actually finished up destroying almost all the records of his own personal emotional progress. Yeah. Which is unfortunate because it contained a lot of truth about emotional development. and. Uh, and that's a sad part of what happened. But it would have been much better if we could have allowed all those things to be in the pageant messages as well. But it would have meant that his own, his own, um, what would you say, his own, the respect that others had for him at the time would have probably lessened, which meant would have meant perhaps that the pageant messages would never even got published. So you know, you've got to just take it as it is, unfortunately. Um, but yes, there was a lot of discussion that we had with him about his emotional development and even a lot of discussion about his own physical and and uh, habits like eating habits uh, smoking he was a smoker and uh, and how much that was impact upon him, impacting upon our ability to connect with him um, there's quite a lot of those kind of messages but unfortunately they all got destroyed yeah. um, should we go down to Suzanne down here if you keep your hand up, Suzanne, just keep your hand up. That's it. We got it behind you. Mm, I could end up saying a lot of things I never meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with something relatively trivial. As far as the pageant messages are concerned, would it be possible for you to write a short synopsis to be included? Because reading them, you keep having Jesus say to him about his emotional condition and you keep wondering for myself, looking to find out how, what that meant about my emotional condition yep. and it stays blank. Yep. So I feel if that was somehow included, 
it would be helpful to people reading it. And the reason why I won't do that is because I feel the Paget messages need to be kept in their pristine state because that's what is there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm perfectly happy to make comments about them, um, but I feel that incorporating those comments into a book form would then almost imply that, that, that those comments began when the Paget messages began, which they did not. Right. So I would rather that the integrity of the Paget messages be retained as they currently are and all of the, way, all of the things we've learned since then be discussed as a sort of separate, separate yeah, thing. Enough. So, yeah. for example, in the Paget messages, there are messages about reincarnation, for example, that, that the spirits in the spirit world now know and I myself now know to be different to what we were saying in the Paget messages 100 years ago. Right. But, but it's important that the Paget, I feel that any channeled material retain its original flavour. And no matter what that original flavour is, even if it has some error in it, the beauty of doing that is that down the track, you'll be able to identify the specific emotional condition of the medium <coughs> and how that affected the message. Whereas at the moment, um, everyone just assumes the pageant messages were channeled in complete accuracy uh, with no error whatsoever. <coughs> but that's not true at all. And, and it cannot ever be true with channeled material because channeled material always comes through the emotional filter of the, of the medium and, and as such is always going to be influenced by their emotional filters. And, uh, and so naturally that needs to be illustrated. And one of the reasons why I'm trying to help many of you develop mediumistically is to st start showing to the world this particular truth that, that the messages that can come through you can only come through you in more accuracy the more emotions that you deal with. That gets rid of the filtering process. And in the end, many of you will become much better mediums than Paget himself was in terms of accuracy of information that can be transmitted. Mm -hmm. But that's why I resist that particular yeah. thing. I love things retaining their original uh, their, their original creation, even if that creation was in error, mm. right? because it illustrates the condition at the time. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I have experience of that and I agree with you. Yeah. Mm. So what was the other question you had mm. that's a bit more in detail, Susan? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a whole can of worms going. I know. So after watching the Divine Truths DVD mm. a couple of weeks ago, my partner shared with me that he'd gone through a period of being, of having relationships with other women mm -hmm. after we'd been in a pretty um, close relationship for 10 years. Yeah. It, the, the glue started to come apart and there are, there are many parts to that. Um, we'd become involved with another guru type teacher mm -hmm. who had heavily influenced our ideas about commitment and sexuality yeah. and that had affected me and eventually it really affected him as well. Mm -hmm. And we're both in a state of not being sure whether we're soulmates or not. Mm -hmm. I've been inclined to think not because I've become so aware of how heavy the codependence is in the relationship, particularly my part of it. Yeah. And so initially when it happened, I was actually <laughs> foolishly very pleased to be told. Yeah. And then it started to sink in and my, my first reaction was that I kind of numbed it out. I went into shock and then I started to numb it out. Yeah. Yeah. And very fortunately, I sent an email and Mary answered me. And she answered me so crystal clear in a very, very short one page email mm -hmm. that I printed off and colour highlighted that I sat down and I started to use that to, to process. Yeah. And there was just one sentence in it and it was that I, all my life that I had, um, oh wow, now you don't want to go there. That all my life I had depreciated my worth and my loving values by overlooking the things that had happened in my marriage and with my current partner and with my father mm -hmm. and in fact with many men in my life. And it just took so long for that to get through the shell. I would sit down with it for hours at a time and just read it and try to get it to go in yeah. a bit further because 
I realised I had become so incredibly practised at not noticing that I did that. Yeah. yeah. And then I started to realise also that I'd done that with some women in my life as well. Yeah. So where <laughs> where I'm at at the moment, and I, it's very hard in all of this to be really clear once you become very emotional or very upset what the appropriate action is to do in this. My suggestion to you, Susan, is to not take action right. yet. The reason why I say that is because when we're in an emotional state, our most highest priority is to complete the emotion. Right. And rather than taking action upon the emotion, we're far better off completing the emotion first. Now, the emotions that you're starting to feel are emotions of deep hurt in the way that men have treated you and, dis and, and, and how you've even treated yourself in relationship to the man. And the key is to allow yourself to fully experience those emotions inside of yourself first before you take any actions. Right. Because any actions you take at this point will be very much influenced by any emotional error that's still there within you. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. And also, you're in this situation now where truth has been told to you and it's really great that you've been told the truth and, and, uh, and that's a wonderful thing that for both of you that that's happened. Mm. But the, the difficult part now is feeling your way emotionally through this truth. The key is to allow yourself to feel your emotional way through this truth rather than numbing yourself out of the truth, right. rather than trying to go. And there is going to be some grief there. There's going to be some grief related to all sorts of issues in terms of how you've personally been treated, how certain things you've ignored, how you enabled certain things to happen because of your hook into men and getting a men's approval. Right. And all of these kind of emotions will start coming up and, and flow out of you. And the key is to allow them all to come and flow. And that's the reason for Mary's email to you. So mm -hmm. she wanted to help you do that. She could feel that you were numbing out to yes. it yeah. and she wanted to say to you, like, don't numb out of this, Susan, because it, this is a really good chance to really grow from, from these experiences. Mm -hmm. When you get to the other end of that and feel a lot of those emotions are lifted from you, then you'll know exactly what to do inside of yourself. And when you know exactly what to do inside of yourself, that's when to act. Right, well, that's very helpful. Does that Thank make you. Sense? Yeah. Right. So don't try to act at any point in time until you feel you must act. And whenever you ask somebody else, "What should I do?" you're really not feeling in for yourself when you must act. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if I'm asking Mary, "What do I do?" I'm really wanting her to tell me what to do because I still haven't worked out how to act. What I need to do is feel what I'm feeling first, work my way through that. And then I won't feel like asking Mary, what do I do? Because I will actually know what I should do right now. And wow. right now is different to a week's time, by the way. Right. So right now you might go, I know what I've got to do. I've got to leave right now. And, weeks, and you leave and you go to a motel room and for a week you cry. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And then you realise, oh, right now I've got to be back home. <laughs> you know? And so you go back home and you stay there. Do you know what I mean? It yeah. won't be... Understand that no decision also has to be a permanent decision. You have complete free will, which also gives you the free will to change your mind at any point in time. Right. right? And you're allowed to do that. So if you feel you must act right now and leave something, act right now and leave it. But if in a week's time you feel like you made a mistake, go and say to the person you made a mistake and you know, act in a different way. So I think you were saying there's a difference between figuring it all out and having an action plan, a difference between that and actually just living in the truth of whatever's emotionally happening right now. Yeah. yeah. And understand that as you're processing the emotions that your actions will be very, very different. So you'll process through one emotion of your, you know, that you allowed certain things to happen and then you'll feel, oh boy, I'm partly guilty about all of this, you know, and you know, and suggesting that I was okay with it when I wasn't and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then you'll realise you might go through some anger with the guru, you know, like how dare he have done that yeah, and told me that. And That's really huge. You know what I mean? And, and you'll feel the anger with that and then you'll go into the sadness of like, oh, no, like, look at me. How easily led was I mm -hmm. by this man telling me all these things that in the mm -hmm. end, like, I didn't feel it was right. 
you know, mm. and you'll cry mm. about that and then you'll go through. And then after you come out a lot of those type of emotions, the key is to allow yourself to feel them, go through the feelings of them. When you come out of those emotions, you will know specifically for yourself how you want to act right. and then act. Don't put that off because mm. of fear of security or fear of something else. Just act. And everything will happen fine if you, if you can do that. The, the key is sometimes I've felt like I've had that, like, like we've been in an interaction, myself and Mary, where I felt, no, I've just got to leave, Mary. I'm sorry, I've just got to leave. And I, off I trot out the door, Mary's crying or whatever and saying, please stay or whatever. I say, no, got to leave. And, bang, and off I'm down. And I'm down the tent, <laughs> you know, which is about, you know, <laughs> 500 yards away from the house, right? And I'm down the tent and I'm processing, crying. I'm usually walking my way down there crying, right? <laughs> and then crying down the tent. And I might be there for a day. Mm -hmm. And then I come back up and I want to talk about it with Mary. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I Every see. single moment you can act differently, yeah. right? And if you're both open to each other still, you can do that together. If you're not both open to each other still, then you'll probably have to do that separately. But, but the issue is, I feel, understand that when you're in an emotional state, that's not always the best time to act. The best time to act is when you're in clarity. Right? Now, you can be in an emotional state and in clarity at the same time, mm -hmm. but uh, sometimes we're in an emotion about my father, not about this man that I'm living with. Mm -hmm. And if I'm acting towards this man I'm living with as if he's my father, then you know, that, that's obviously not clarity anymore. So like if Mary's saying to me, you did this, you did that, and I'm going, when did I do that? Like, I can see where, what you're saying. Your father did that, but I never did that. You know, um, That's not a moment of clarity for Mary to make a decision on that. Now, she's totally able to make a decision on that if she wants, and often if she does, she might go off on that tangent and then realise, because she's taken the emotion to the finish, realise, wow, that was really about my father, <laughs> you know, and then come back and talk to me about that. So it, a lot of times it doesn't really matter how it's handled as long as you stay in the emotional you connection stay in the of transaction. that and stay in the transaction of it and allow yourself to feel the way through it and keep the emotions flowing. In the end, you'll know what to do. Right. You'll know the truth of what you do. And you're allowed to make a mistake. <laughs> Good because I have. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to. Yeah. Right? You're even allowed to make a mistake with your soulmate. Mm. You're allowed to make a mistake with God too. You're allowed to. Right? Mm. Like I've made plenty of mistakes. You're going to make plenty of mistakes on this path too. Right? You're allowed to. One of the things is God loves you through all of your mistakes <laughs> as well. And you're allowed to do that. So, so just allow the emotions to continue flowing. The reason why Mary gave you the email is because she was concerned about the numbness. Yes. When you go into that state... Yeah. That's not helpful at all. No, and I was completely mm. not. Yeah. So, but just one or two other things that I wanted to run past you. When I came here yesterday, the last thing in the world I expected was for the talk to be about soulmate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so it's really it's profoundly appropriate. And yesterday during the talk, I developed a huge migraine, and was incredibly nauseated. And when I got home last night, I was very, very distressed. And I, one of the problems that I'm having with processing, um, which you've shared with me before, is a real difficulty in crying. I can't cry. So it's like I get to the cusp of an emotion and I just sit on an agony edge and I yeah. can't, can't tip. So I, just, uh, I went to bed last night and um, I slept and I still felt sick this morning. But in, in the getting motivated to come back, I actually felt... A lot better and during the day I actually started to feel really really good mm -hmm. and I'd like to know does that mean that I've actually I've actually processed something and I'm feeling better or have I just skimmed away from it and um, there's some truths you've accepted in the process over the last two days but you still have the issue with crying about these truths yeah. so that whenever you receive a truth you will feel better and not all truths need to have an emotional response for you to receive it. There'll be an emotional response of joy when you receive it. In other mm -hmm. words, not grief in, for many truths. But the issue of regard to your migraine, your migraine was the heavy suppression of sadness. So that's right. what caused your migraine. So there's a heavy desire in you to suppress your grief. So what, what I would look at myself in those situations is, why am I afraid of my grief? So rather than trying to get to my grief, I would look at why am I so afraid of this grief? Mm. 
Right. What, what, what emotions in me cause me to fear this grief that I know is there mm. so much that I'm willing to shut it down? And, and what, so what I call that is a, identifying your blockage to your grief. And you do need to feel your blockages. So one of the blockages is what's going to happen if I grieve this? Will I still be connected to my partner? Mm. You know, that's a blockage. Because what happens if you grieve it and then you realise, hey, I, I'm not really connected to my partner now. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, uh, happened uh, then? Yeah, I've identified, I mean, I've written pages yep. in the meantime and I've identified a lot to do with security. Okay, um, yeah. To, to do with oh, so many things. One of them is just the separation from my best friend. Yes. Because in the past, that's been, that's where I've gone. That's to, always been your partner. Yeah, been my partner and been my support. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of fears in that. And a lot of those have shifted yep. over the weekend. Yeah. And the other one that I wanted to ask you, I have a lot of experiences of um, Friday morning, I just woke up feeling like my whole body was going to blow apart. Mm -hmm. And I have, quite often in the morning, I'll wake up and be in a state of deep worry or terror. And I've wondered for a long time what goes on at night that, that seemingly you can go to bed in one place and in the morning you wake up and there's this whole thing going on and there's nothing particularly to relate it to and no way to really understand it. Yeah, it's a very good question. If you wake up in dread or terror, mm -hmm. then that means there are certain things in your sleep state that you're aware of that you are very afraid of being aware of in your awake state. Yeah, I'd say that's right. right. Yeah. So the key to, to processing that kind of terror is to start allowing yourself to see that you must be afraid of things in your awake state that you don't want to see. So mm. what I do myself is I just write down all the things that I feel I may not want to see. Right, so I start addressing the issue. Just, just allowing, see a lot of the stuff is about, actually about allowing the soul to feel, right? And if, if I can't allow myself to see it, I'm never going to allow myself to feel it. So one of the best ways of actually closing down my emotion is to close down my awareness. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, yeah. One of the easiest ways to close down your emotion is to close down your awareness of what you're afraid of. And the way you do that is by becoming blind to it, basically. So you become blind to your own awareness. Mm -hmm. But in your sleep state, that's a lot more difficult to achieve. And so what happens if you wake up in a state of dread, there's a lot of things you're not facing in your awake state. Mm -hmm. And the best thing to do is just acknowledge that and then pray about the generality of that and ask God through your law of attraction to show you what those things are specifically. Uh, and then over the coming weeks, it'll be shown to you generally what the specific reasons are for those particular dreads that you're experiencing in your sleep state. Which brings me to my last question, mm -hmm. and then I'll get out of the way. Um, since I've been watching all of the Divine Love material, I've become very confused about talking to God mm -hmm. because I feel like verbal talking, I start that, and then I go, you're a prat, you're just talking to yourself, and yeah, yeah. you know, this, is, this memo will never get delivered kind of thing. Yeah. And then I move into trying to be emotional about what I'm trying to convey, and it kind of dries up on me. Right. And then I get really frustrated and think, I just can't do this. Yep. And d then I try to find other ways to get through to God, like being in gratitude, which would have been one of my original forms of prayer. Yep. But I just feel like I'm going round and round and really not achieving anything. Yep. My suggestion is start with the intellectual prayer. Right. And, and allow yourself to sink into the emotion of it. So, so, so when I sort of say that, let's say we start with intellectual prayer as a, like, I really don't know what I'm doing here, might be one of the things. I really don't know what I'm doing here. I really like, don't understand what I'm doing here. And then you start allowing yourself to feel the emotion of that, just repeating that over to yourself even. Just allow yourself to feel, God, I really don't know what I'm doing here. Like, you know, and you start to really start to express that completely. Yeah. Right. Like, and then even yell it or something if it's anger or if it's, or if it's grief, just you know, cry it out. And by now, you're, see now God's hearing you. By this time you're getting down into the emotion connection right. of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Now God's hearing you, you see. The message is getting delivered well and truly at that particular point. And the key is to allow yourself to get emotional about what you're, what you're saying. 
So stay the words, but let yourself feel the emotion that the words are conveying as mm -hmm. well at the same time. That's brilliant. Thank you. I yeah. can feel that. Good work. Mary. Uh, Sometimes when I'm emotional, then I ask God to be involved as well. Like when I'm already emotional, then I, you know, I talk to God during that experience. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of ways of sinking into your emotion, um, and and the key is to like use everything as a tool to connect emotionally. So the words in your mind are a tool to help you connect emotionally. You can just start saying the words, right? But then you can start sinking into those words as an emotional expression of those yeah. words as well. Allow yourself to do that. And you, you're actually going to be very good at it. So you just need to allow yourself to sink into that. There's a lot of, unfortunately for yourself, Suzanne, there's been a lot of um, intellectual, natural love type development that's mm -hmm. caused you to get away from what you know in your own soul is the best way to process your own emotion. Right, yeah. And... and Unfortunately, there's still this tendency to believe what the men on the internet, on the, the men, and it's mostly men, yeah. who have told you these other paths of dealing with their stuff. Right. And there's this, still this desire to sort of think that hopefully they're right, you know, when, when they're not. And you already know at the soul level they're not right with regard to how you deal with things. And, and I feel that once you let go of this issue with men, that you've got to trust the guru man sort of thing, and you instead get into the allowance of your own understanding of your own emotions, you'll find that things will process very rapidly mm. for you, I feel. Yeah. And the, the guru man thing is still really looking for the completeness in my father, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's all related to your father. Seeking daddy's approval yes, it's and huge. acceptance. Mm. And, and uh, you know, a guru comes along and then you start to want to seek his approval and acceptance. And unfortunately, a lot of men are, who are gurus are not in very good spiritual condition and they misuse their guru status for sexual, fidel in, in, for sexual infidelity. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it's very, influence, it, very easy for them to influence many women into changing their own sexual morality inside of themselves to suit the man's. And that just causes a huge destruction for, for many women on spiritual paths. So there are many women on spiritual paths who have been heavily influenced sexually by guru men who his only real goal is to connect with spirits and help the spirits abuse women. And unfortunately, it's happening all over the planet. Mm. Um, yeah. okay, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, what is the time? It must be fairly late. Six o'clock. And what would you like to add, babe, before we... Uh, I think I talked about that last time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking you should too. Suzanne, I just wanted... I um, have been uh, experimenting with some other stuff to help me when I'm blocked because um, I used to try and diaphragmatically breathe um, and I know you've tried the overhead breathing thing and still feeling a bit blocked. I get really in my head when I'm trying to do that because I'm like, oh, am I doing it right? Oh, is that right? Oh, I can't, am I, you know, and it completely defeats the purpose for me. So what I've been, and you, you need your own space probably to do this, but when I feel blocked, like I know I've got grief but I'm not getting there, um, what I try and do is I lie down and I feel about it in my body and then I stand up. And I just decide, okay, I'm going to give this uh, sound and movement what's happening. I'm going to um, express this block. Can, um, you, can you show? You? It's really She's embarrassing. Ma Mary's, really, <laughs> Mary's really afraid of showing you. She's really afraid on a number of levels because um, Mary's been pretty badly attacked by a number of people at the moment. And, and so she's really afraid of exposing her own... Uh, emotions and own emotional processing. But I, I, when Mary showed me what she was doing, I just wished that I knew how to do that six years ago um, because it would have helped me <laughs> work through quite a lot of my stuff, I feel. And it seems like a really, I, like to me, when Mary demonstrated to me, it seems like a really good way for many women to connect to emotion as well uh, because it, it, it's... Uh, it's a very physical connection thing with body. To uh, it's very hard to 
you can't really describe it. So you, I don't. I, I sort of feel it would be good for you to show. Okay. Sorry. So um, I just try and, like I said, just feel it in my body. And I don't, I don't have any expectation about how it's going to go. And I just, I allow the experience. Uh, anyway, I'll, it's hard. I feel quite emotionally open today, so I might just go straight into processing. But sometimes it takes a few times for me just to feel, like, express whatever it is. And then I go back to, okay, what else is there? And just, so... Um, you don't have a mic. It's really basic. I just stand there <laughs> and try and feel what's in my body and I just try and like the other day I was feeling really oppressed um, so I just felt like right I just <laughs> When, when uh, Mary started doing it, like um, she was, she had some of this anger coming up because of how her brother is treating her on the internet, and and she just started to express the anger of it, like like this. So up until then, she was tempted to sort of project all of this rage at her brother, which is obviously not not the best way to go about dealing with your emotion, and. And so, but, but instead now what she was doing is just owning the anger and allowing her body to exp express the anger of it. Like, and within a few moments you shifted straight from that anger into a bit of grief and, and, and when I say a bit of grief, she, she, she at one point went away and just cried for an hour like, because of just, just that emotional expression of the anger and using her own body. And so n not using anything to hit or to... That's what I used. Yeah, and that, didn't and that didn't do it for you before, did it? Like before, Mary would grab a stick or a baseball bat or a tennis racket, and bash the hell out of something. But but it didn't have the same effect on her shifting things emotionally. Yeah, all shuts down because the whacking of something is often a very masculine sort of thing to do. And I think this is why this is probably more going to be a lot, uh, very effective for a lot of women because, because uh, like for me, I, I find doing that feels a bit strange. But when I get out with a baseball bat, I can really go for it, right? So, so it's a bit, there's, I think there's a bit more about the internalisation versus the externalisation of the emotion. And this seems to really just get that emotion yeah, flowing. Yeah, when I was breathing, I was just thinking about the mechanics all the time. But when I just... I, it's just giving expression to what I felt in my body, yeah. in a way, and it just seemed to really shift things. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's getting pretty late now, so we wanted to finish. And um, tomorrow night, we're just at, uh, we'll be down at Brisbane tomorrow night. There's going to be a talk down at Brisbane. 
Yeah, we're going to talk about truth and judgment. It's actually about emotions. It's a, a series that I'm doing on the human soul called Emotions. So the actual title is The Human Soul, Emotions, Truth and Judgment. And we'll talk about the effect of judgment on your emotions and the effect of truth on your emotions and the difference between truth and judgment as well. So that's our, our discussion tomorrow night. I think it's 7 o'clock at the Bracken Ridge Hall for those who want to go along. And, uh, and then myself and Mary head off uh, home a, a day or so after that. So, but thank you so much for your time again. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you.